Peace and blessings, y'all. Back with another chapter, A True to the Game by Terry Woods. Back to business. Quadir rolled over from his sleeping position, brought himself to an upright stance, and planted his feet on the floor. He looked around his bedroom. The new burgundy carpet he had just laid set it off. Everything was new and very contemporary. Turning on a 60-inch screen, he turned the videos. As he landed on a channel, he threw the remote on the bed and promptly picked up his weed tray. Things were really starting to happen for Quadir. He was getting money and a lot of it. He had a squad of youngsters who covered the street corners, had old heads who backed them, and he just went through 150 kilos of cocaine, if not more, every week. One month, he went through 1,200 kilos. That was his best month. Not only were things going really good, he had women. He had more women than any man he knew. He had so many women, you would think he was the only man on earth. They would do anything he wanted. Anything. He lived his life in a fast lane. Fast women, fast money, fast cars. And the beeper always needed fresh batteries. Things were falling into place. Another year and Quadir would be straight. Just one more year. He thought to himself. He laid there with his boxer shorts on, holding his crotch with one hand, smoking with the other. Picking up his watch from the nightstand, he noted it was 12.30 in the afternoon. I really slept in, he thought to himself, walking into the living room. Another widescreen TV sat catty-cornered against a far wall. A round aquamarine colored sectional leather sofa, a large glass circle-shaped table, a custom-made peach-colored carpet with an aquamarine border going around the wall as his latest interior design. There was a dining room, but Kwa made that into the playroom, where he put a pool table, and though he was never imbibed, a fully stocked marble bar. All beautifully set off by bi-level mirror walls and Hollywood ceilings, Kwa was a man of good taste, and he kept his apartment immaculate. It wasn't the only apartment he had, either. Quadir had a room at his mom's house, another house where he let Rasson stay, and yet another apartment, far from the city, where he could discreetly take his female companions, but no one knew about it, not even Rasson. He never allowed anyone to know about this place. It was the only place he felt he could relax, the only place he got any good sleep. The old heads had left no stone unturned when it came to Quadir, knowing what was out there. The larger Qua became, the more to himself he became. He trusted no one and knew that everyone was out to get him or a piece of him. It was really fucked up, and he learned to be extra careful. Rock wasn't careful. His funeral was today. Kwa could not believe that it was the junior mafia who took the boy out. Just couldn't believe it. Didn't want to believe it. Kwa knew that killing Rock meant they wanted war. He also knew that, by no means, should the boy's death go unavenged. Easing onto his leather sofa... He played back all the conversations he had gathered from the streets. He knew that Rock's death was nothing more than the Junior Mafia sending him a message, indirectly. Rick knew what he was talking about when he said the Junior Mafia was trying to weaken him. Rock was flipping keys, getting G's, and since Quadir supplied him, as well as a handful of others, Quadir was vulnerable through the people underneath him. He had to be certain of everyone he dealt with. Those worst nightmares was getting snitched on. All he needed was an indictment behind somebody else's bullshit. He didn't want to deal with that, no more than his people's getting killed for buying coke for him, instead of the junior mafia. He thought about Rock's funeral. He would not be there. He had been asked to be a pallbearer, but demurred. Kwa wasn't really sure why he wasn't going. He really felt bad about Rock dying, but going to the funeral wouldn't make much of a difference. Rock was gone, and Quadel will remember him the way he was. Besides, the hoes be clocking a nigga at a funeral. It's fucked up to say, but it's true. Yeah, they might shed a tear or two, but they're hoping to get a number and meet up with a nigga later. On top of that, the feds would be there taking pictures and videotaping. Quad dialed a number from his pager and carried his portable phone into the bathroom while he showered. Dressed, he made himself a turkey and cheese sandwich, then returned to the couch and waited for the phone to ring. Hello? He said. After answering the phone on the first ring, nothing, taking it easy, man, he said, 
The man on the other end controlled the conversation, the same way Quade did with his people. Next week, same place, I'll be there. He then dialed Rasson at his mom's house and told him to meet up with him on the Ave later. Then he dialed Amar. Assalamu alaikum, said Amar, answering the phone. Alaikum assalam, Quade replied. You just the brother I wanted to talk to. What's going on, player? Nothing much, man. Getting ready to go to this funeral, said Amar. You going to the funeral? Asked Kwa, thinking of rock. Man, I got two funerals to go to. This girl I used to fuck with and rocks, said Amar. Kwa didn't realize he was talking about Sahara. She sure did get around. He thought about asking Amar whether he knew Gina, but decided against it. You going to Rock's funeral? Asked Amar. No, you know I don't do funerals. I must be there. I'm a pallbearer, said Amar. What? Said Kwa, thinking about his own refusal of the offer. Kwa did let a moment go by. So what's happening otherwise? I'm ready to see you. I want to go to 15th Street. You on a hundredth? Asked Kwa. Yeah, I'm there. One hour, said Kwa. Everything the same? You know it. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam, said Kwa there, hanging up the phone. Three minutes later, he was out the door. He got in his 1987 Cutlass Oldsmobile and went straight to the For You Self Storage Inc. Inside his compartment was some furniture and a safe. Just like the one in his apartment, only this one contained 523 kilos of cocaine. He grabbed 15 bricks and put them in a duffel bag. He then placed another one in a shopping bag, which he was going to take to Miss Shug's house. He jumped back in the car and drove to a supermarket, parking at the rear of the lot, then rolled the spliff and set the CD player. He sat patiently, as if waiting for someone in the store to finish their shopping, until finally, Amar pulled into the parking lot. He parked next to Kwa. Both got out and shook hands, as brothers do. What's up, man? said Amar. You looking good, player? answered Kwa. Yeah, man, you know me. I gotta be right for my man. Kwa and Amar talked for a few minutes. Amar assured Kwa that there was 100,000 in the trunk of the squatter. Kwa in return assured Amar that there was 15 kilos of cocaine in the duffel bag on the back seat. Kwa watched Amar get in the Oldsmobile while he got in the squatter Amar had been driving. He dropped the money off at his apartment and put it in the safe. He then headed down North Philly to see Miss Shug. Kwa pulled onto the narrow one-way street and parked in front of Shug's house. He grabbed the bag out of the back seat. The moment he opened the door, he could hear Miss Shug hollering down the street. And don't come back in this motherfucker until you learn how to act. She was cursing some man out for the entire block to hear. You dumbass motherfucker. I don't even know why I let you in here. You not fit to be in no house. Who was that? He asked her, walking up to the side door. Some nigga my granddaughter bought in here, Shug replied. His ass damn sure look like what the cat drug in. Don't make no sense. He gonna stand up there and tell me to go to hell. He lucky I didn't break his goddamn neck, she said, taking a breath. Come on, get your ass back in the house. Titties hanging out and shit. How you playing, Shug? See, you got all the neighbors looking. Come on, said Kwa, walking her back in the house. Kids was all over the place, and as soon as they seen Kwa there, they ran over to him to get a dollar. The house was always junky, but today, it seemed as if there was abundance of junkiness, cluttering up any space the house may have once had. You could easily tell that too many people were occupying a three-bedroom row home. Where do all these motherfuckers sleep? Kwa thought to himself, looking around. Shug, why the house so hot? asked Kwa. All these lazy niggas in here? Shit, you can hardly breathe in this motherfucker. I wish they would come and get their kids and take them the hell on somewhere and buy my fan that them heathens done broke today. They got my blood pressure up so high. Lord, I'm surprised I haven't dropped dead. She took the bag out of his hand and broke up the coke. There's no way in the cat's ass you gonna get me in this hot ass kitchen cooking all this shit today. I cook some, but I'm not cooking all of it. You hear me, Kwa dear? Yeah, I hear you. As he sat next to the kitchen window, talking to Suge, he felt a cool breeze. He talked to Miss Suge about everything. She had her ways, but she wasn't nobody's fool. Most old people weren't. 
They had been here long enough to know how not to play the fool. Suge was full of wisdom. It was one thing to hear her, it was another to listen. When she was done, Quade handed her $500 a step. When you gonna get my fan, she asked. Tomorrow. Nigga, you know you is a lie. Besides, I'm gonna give me an air conditioner right now. You better before your ass drop dead in that motherfucker, holla Quadir. He got in a Mars squatter after Shug cursed him out and headed down to the Ave. Everyone was out. It was the crew. Qua was happy to see his bucks out there. He shook hands with everyone and got right in the middle of the conversations with them and started kicking it. Yo, look at that girl, Pookie said, pointing his finger. On the opposite side of the street, approximately 20 feet from where they stood, a girl had pulled her pants down, exposing herself. She slightly bent her knees and started peeing in the broad daylight between two parked cars. She really don't give a fuck, said Ra. She gotta be high, said Reds. I told y'all, Pipers were inheriting the earth, said Pookie. We spotted three girls walking down the opposite side of the street. Hey, baby in the blue, he called out. Why are you messing with them girls, said Pookie, turning his face up. Yo, I like fat girls too, don't get it twisted. I'm not one to discriminate. Skinny, fat, tall, short, light, dark, it don't make no difference, man, said Wiz. The girls walked over to Wiz and engaged him in a conversation. The rest of them looked at the girls real mean with a don't even think about expression on their face. I got a boyfriend, said the girl in the blue. So, I got a girlfriend, said Wiz. Well, why are you trying to talk to me? Because, can't we be friends? said Wiz. No, I don't think so, said the girl, as if she had checked Wiz out and was completely turned off. Oh, well, fuck you then. Man, leave them girls alone. Excuse him, said Qua as the girls walked by him. Fuck you too, the girl said, walking away. Only if you promise to die it. At that, everyone, even Quadir, had to laugh. Quadir walked over to his jeep, which Ra had parked up the block. Rasson followed right behind him. They decided that Reds and Wiz would go back and cap They decided that Reds and Wiz would go back up the way. They decided that Reds and Wiz would go back up the way and help cap the package. Quadir handed him the keys to Amar's squatter and left. Across town in West Philly, Sahara Bowden was being laid to rest. Outside it looked like a car show. On the inside, Gina saw the girlfriend she and Sahara traveled with. It wasn't packed, but it wasn't empty either. A lot of brothers were there. Bridget said she had seen brothers come through for the viewing. It was really nice that everybody came to say goodbye to Sahara, and even though they didn't stay for the funeral, they did come to play their last respects. She was so young, and she looked so pretty in a soft pink cashmere sweater with a matching skirt. Gina couldn't see her shoes because there were flowers covering the bottom half of the casket. The preacher's bellowing voice Echo over the body of her friend that lay peacefully beneath his pulpit. The congregation agreed with him readily. Miss Bowden had lost control. The funeral nurse rocked her throughout the sermon. Gina sat with her head hanging low, feeling the loss of her best friend like an empty pit at the bottom of her spirit. Who would she laugh with? Who would she share with? Who would be her friend? As the preacher preached, a tear fell for every word he spoke. Why did the words beloved, friend, make her fill up even more? What about Mr. and Mrs. Bowden? They lost a child. How they gonna deal with that? She glanced up and looked around the church. There was a huge crucifix suspended behind the ornate wall where the preachers were standing. Large blocks of stained glass windows allowed the last bit of sunlight to shine through as the service proceeded. The faces of the people sitting in row after row of the beautiful Gothic church were just as tormented and distraught as the next. Dear God, she prayed, take my friend Sahara in your arms. Love her, protect her, give her peace. Gina surveyed those gathered to bid farewell to the young, beautiful girl they all knew, stopping at a familiar face. All prayers and reasoning power flew from her perspective. She couldn't believe it. Sacrilege. He was sitting there two rows in front of her on the right side of the church. He even had the gall to acknowledge that he saw her. Oh my God, she thought, feeling that it was appropriate to express the Lord's name. Jamal was there. 
sitting with Kim. Kim, who just the night before had just preached to Gina about how she should not break up with him. That bitch, Gina thought to herself. She felt a little funny inside seeing Jamal with Kim. That miserable man. She couldn't believe how he had called and offered to bring her, and then had the nerve to show up with Kim. She saw right through him. Jealous that Jamal was there with someone else was one thing. The aching betrayal that was setting in made her furious. Don't nobody need to lie to me. Why didn't she say she was interested in Jamal? Why didn't he say, well, maybe I'll see you there, or anyway, maybe I'll bring Kim. He wasn't paying any respects. He was there to hurt Gina. She faced the altar and concentrated on her friend. The service lasted more than an hour. Sahara would be buried the following morning at 10. After today, Gina didn't know if she could take anymore. She had shed all the tears she wanted to and put the memories of Sahara inside her heart, where they would be forever cherished. Her only consolation was that Gina knew she had a friend in Sahara, and she hoped and prayed to one day see her friend again. The firm believed that Sahara would always be with her, Plus, the memories they shared together is what helped Gina get through the service.